Good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Bryant. I'm the library director, and I have a cold, so you can hear that. I want pity, sympathy, chicken soup recipes, and anything you can recommend. I counted four men, five men in the audience, and that's great. I don't know where the others are, but they'll be coming in a little bit late. But Susan Stein and I were just chatting in the back. This, this program is really of interest to anybody who's interested in what we wear collectively, um, the colors we choose, the history of what we wear, and uh, it's going to be a humdinger. And we're so proud and pleased to have Susan with us. She is the fashion editor of, the, of Palm Springs Life and a delightful person. And um, before we uh, introduce Susan, though, uh, for real, I'd like to mention that Lada Tolkis is here. Lada is a great hero in this library because last year she made a significant gift to this library. And this is our way of saying to Lada, who is absolutely beautiful and dresses better than almost anyone, thank you. Thank you for being here. So we'll have a good time today. And uh, as I said, you'll learn some history, you'll learn some color, you'll learn some taste. You'll learn some, maybe some do's and don'ts, but Susan is, uh, is too sweet to tell anybody that they're dressed terribly. <laughs> um, wouldn't it be weird if she picked one person out and said, you know, you just, you really botched it up and you have to go home. You just can't be part of this because it's not working. No, she is not like that at all. She will like all of you and you'll be a terrific audience. So without further ado, Susan Stein. <laughs> Thank you. David, actually, I'd like to critique your outfit. <laughs> Back at you. <laughs> Black turtlenecks are very chic this season. Happy birthday, first of all. Um, I'm really, really thrilled to be here. I don't know if I know any of you, but if you've seen anything about Fashion Week El Paseo or been involved or Fashion or Modernism Week or even actually had a chance to take a look at our new fashion issue of Palm Springs Life. That's sort of what I do. That's my whole life at this point, except for the good part. The other part, which is also a good part. This is a good part, too. So I was really thrilled to be asked to come here and talk about my favorite subject. Um, I'm not judgmental. I'm not the fashion police. But sometimes I'm brutally honest, so be prepared. But I think you'll enjoy this. I hope you'll enjoy it. Um, what I tried to do was put together why we wear clothes. <laughs> and I bet you're all going to have the wrong reason when I ask you that. So just don't even think about it right now. How did this all get started? And what are we going to do about this? Because everything is really the same, but it changes. And how does that happen? So let's go through a little journey. This is actually. Um, a Valentino fashion show um, recently, and um, I'm, I'm just going to let you know that this had an African theme. And there was quite a contra uh, controversy about this theme for obvious reasons. Um, but you can see how all of the influence of African culture, including the hair and the clothing, turns out in a $10,000 gown. So there you go. That's what happens with fashion. So what is fashion? Anybody have an answer? You can yell out a little bit. Anybody know? What you wear? What you wear? It is sort of. It's what we wear. Fashion is actually what's popular at a given time. So I look at this, and you can see this is from what era? Right, modernism. And this is from what show? Mad Men. OK, one of the best styled shows on television. I don't know if any of you saw some of the clothes of Modernism Week. They had a great display of the actual fashions that were there. They're very authentic, even though many of them were made. A lot of vintage clothes wouldn't hold up to the kind of wear that it needed. Um, but this certainly gives you an idea of what's popular at a given time. So it could be the 60s. It could be the 80s. And there you have Dynasty, am I right? I don't even remember it anymore, but I know it was a show. And there you have someone's interpretation of the 80s on today's runway. 
So the point I'm making is nothing is new. It just keeps happening over and over again. But it's always very exciting. I love the color on this. And we're going to talk a lot more about color and why that was a very good collection. I'm sure you can't read this, which is good because I can make up everything that it says. But this caught my attention because one of the most fascinating things in my life is as I grew up and in this industry, I, I had a lot of wonderful mentors who used to say, I used to be able to buy that dress for $29.99. Why did you pay $200 for it? I can still find a good dress for $29.99. And in today's world, we all can. As a matter of fact, I tell my husband, everything costs $29.99 <laughs> because it balances out. So anyway, this entire outfit for this flapper, which was a very big deal, cost $350, and that was over the top. The hat was about $30. The shoes, which were leather, like we don't have anymore with leather soles, um, were $18. The gloves were $30. The three strands of pearls, which were costume, were about $50. And so that tells you about the quality of that. And the hosiery was four and a half dollars. And I don't know where you could find pantyhose today for four and a half. They didn't even have pantyhose then, but anything like that for that price. This coat, which was ermine trimmed, was about $200. So that was very expensive. So this brings me into trends and the concept of trends. And I found an article written in 1922 about a young girl who was 22 years old and interviewed about why she's a flapper. And what is a flapper? And we know the term, and you've all seen The Great Gatsby. But her reasoning was, well, you know, today women are not like their mothers. They do a lot more than their mothers used to do. They understand men better. I don't know how that ever happened. But anyway, they understand men, and they understand men's work better. They are free to do things. They know that they're going to have a lot more fun, and they wear lipstick and makeup like grown-ups do. She was 22 years old. I have a seven-year-old granddaughter who talks like that today, which is really the way our society has changed. And I think a lot of this has to do with the internet and how quickly communication moves. And that has a lot to do with trends. So we'll talk about that next. Very good. <laughs> that is Chanel. But the question is, I asked you first, what is fashion? And you said, fashion is what you wear. So we now know that fashion is what's popular at a given time. But who can tell me what style means and what style actually is? It's je ne sais quoi. OK, that's good. But it's got to have more of a definition for people who don't know what that is. It's having that special something that sets you apart, that makes you look really outstanding, like walking around. Come on up, I'm done. That was perfect. <laughs> that was absolutely perfect. And style is a particular look that you yourself have developed. For instance, in fashion, if we were talking about what's in style, what's in fashion this year, we would say maybe boots, OK? Then the style of the boots might be short boots, might be boots without toes, which I totally don't understand, or which might be flat boots or high boots. But that is style. So when I talk about Chanel, no matter when this picture was taken and no matter when that picture was taken, the style was the same. So that was the style. Chanel, of course, always had the most brilliant quotes. If you just want to have fun and you love fashion, Google Chanel quotes and you'll be busy for two hours. Fashion is what you buy. Style is what you do with it. She also said, fashion is made to go out of style and to become obsolete. And you know why she said that? Because she was an excellent businesswoman. And that's exactly why. OK. And then one of today's, I don't know if you've heard of Stacey London. She's had a TV show. But she said, never confuse fashion and style. Fashion relies on unattainable looks on women with unrealistic bodies. Style is about utilizing the best aspects of you. So instantly, we're not afraid of fashion anymore. We're not afraid of clothes, because it's all about us, 
which is really our big secret anyway. So personal style is just what you were talking about, that it's what you do with your style, with yourself and what looks best for you. In this case, I chose Cher. And this is a recent Louis Vuitton ad that Cher did. It's quite wonderful, but she still has the style for today. One of the great things about Cher is that her look is consistent. Uh, <laughs> I have to really laugh when I say that, because that's sort of sad. But it is consistent. You're never shocked when you see it. You're just entertained. Um, and Cher and Bob Mackie had a great relationship was her designer. Today, celebrities and stars don't necessarily have designers. What do they have? They have stylists, OK? Many years ago, even back to medieval times, people didn't have designers. They had dressmakers. And it probably wasn't until, oh, the French in um, probably Louis the 14th and then again Louis the 16th said we've got to get some fashion out here so coutures were really you know introduced couturiers and that became important some people have iconic style i don't even have to tell you who that is you of course know it and it says jackie looks polished in a boxy jacket pillbox hat elbow length gloves as she rides in a motorcycle and you're, it's pretty consistent and then there we go. So this, these are one of the ways trends are set, because we see people that we sort of would like to emulate. How many of you here wanted to have that look in the 60s? <laughs> right, everybody did. I mean, and it, ironically, she did so much for the fashion industry because of it. And I have two style icons. Anyone know who that is? OK, and ordinarily, I would show Grace Kelly in a big, full, gorgeous gown or, or with her hair flowing. But still, her personal style comes through in that wonderful look. If you'd seen that on Katherine Hepburn, that's a different look. But it would look different because of the way she wore it. And Audrey Hepburn, not in a black dress like you would ordinarily see, but a great white shirt. And that face doesn't need a lot of tchotchkes, if you know what I mean. Stuff. Modern day icons, Kate, Kate brought back pantyhose. She brought back stockings for women. And you know, I don't know if you've noticed in stores, they're not quite sure where to put that pantyhose department anymore. You have to say, where are they? And they go, oh, they're somewhere under here. So that used to be one of the best sellers in a lot of retail stores. Now people are starting to wear them again, and it's quite nice. I pick Sarah Jessica Parker because she still really is an iconic dresser. If you see her at the Met Gala every year, the first thing everyone looks at is what is SJP wearing. So those are really our trendsetters for today. Now, talking about trends, what is it that actually creates trends? And there are lots of things. The economy, that's pretty obvious. You talk about World War II, you talk about World War I, fashion changed because of what was going on in the world. Um, there was a time when you know people needed silk for other things, so people didn't wear stockings during the war, but they wore seams because they painted them up the back of their leg with them. I don't know where they got magic markers, but I can't imagine they used a regular pen to do that. Celebrities, unfortunately, I have to tell you, have, I shouldn't say that, but now you know how I feel about them. But celebrities really set fashion. Um, can you name a celebrity who you really think sets fashion or people copy? Lady Gaga. Lady Gaga? OK. I think she impresses us with her fashion, but I don't know so much as people wear what she wears, but you're right. Anyone else? Mrs. Obama, we'll get to that in a moment, absolutely. Other celebrities, I just want one or two more. OK, and another one? Sienna Miller. Sienna Miller, right. Hi, how are you? <laughs> that's one of my favorite designers over there. And she, Sienna's gorgeous. And that's it. But everybody watches someone different for the person that they relate to the most. Okay. 
politics. I'm not even going to, I'm not allowed to talk about it. I just had to put it there so you know, but I think we're going to have some surprises. Political situations, of course, do change it. Runways are not as big an influence on fashion as the red carpet has been in the last few years. Designers also, just a little tip about runways, are stopping these huge fashion shows that are very theatrical and show things that people actually can't wear now. So the trend is to go to fashion shows that you can actually buy the clothes right after you've seen them, and it's very successful. So what, what this means is they're becoming more realistic and saying, well, we really are here to sell the clothes, aren't we? So that's what they're trying to do. Movies, can you think of a movie that affected fashion? Annie Hall, for sure. Bonnie and Clyde. Bonnie and Clyde. I love that. What else? The Great Gatsby brought back the 20s for about 20 seconds, but it brought it back <laughs> for a while. I know, everybody had a Great Gatsby event for a few years, too, which was great. I remember a movie called Working Woman. Wasn't that it with Melanie Griffith? Working Girl. Okay, the Lauren Bacall, and that's right, and Marilyn Monroe, and that's right, another movie. So you know that a lot of movies do. The street, street fashion is really very important, and there are many people out there today watching everything you wear to predict trends for the future, and that's where they get those ideas. Music, all I have to do is say David Bowie. I think about that. I think about the Beatles. Uh, that had a big influence. Everybody started to let their hair grow and take that kind of influence. What about today? Music, Lady Gaga, you mentioned. Madonna. Madonna was a challenge because she just kept changing all the time and reinventing herself, and that was very well done. Designers, of course, and technology, because you'll all be wearing 3D clothes and accessories in the next few years. But that doesn't mean everything, maybe just one or two pieces. So that's what makes trends happen. Now, question, what is a trend? I love it. I, I teach a class at FITM, and I ask this. Uh, the first question I ask them is, what is fashion? And they go, I don't know. I say, well, you're like going to be a fashion student, and then we go through it. Somebody want to guess what a trend is? Temporary, sort of. I'll save you some time. A trend, if you think of trends, think of the word moving. A trend is the direction in which fashion is moving. And to make it even more interesting, this is how it moves. Some of you will recognize this. So, oh, I get to use the laser. I love when I do this. So over here, we have the beginning. And these people are the really creative people. They could be designers. They could be celebrities. They're the people that come up with these crazy ideas that maybe someone will like. Very few percentage. They're called the innovators. Then we have more people that start, start to adopt it. And I'm sure today you've all heard the term adopters or early adopters. This is that great chasm where if it doesn't succeed, goodbye, it's gone. OK, and this happens with almost all technology. Then we go up to the early majority, which is most people. And these people up here are the ones that are really into that, and it's become very, very popular. By the way, back here, you might have something that Kim Kardashian wore or J-Lo wore, and then everybody starts to copy it. When it gets up here, it's pretty much just about ready to be marked down. <laughs> so <laughs> that's a word everyone got, right? On sale. <laughs> so anyway, when it's up here, it's great. Sometimes it stays up here. And do you know what they're called? Good, that's right. They're called classics. And things like a white shirt, a strand of pearls, a little black dress. Give me some more. A black turtleneck. All right. Well, they go in and out, but it is a classic. A blazer for a man, a khaki pair of pants. They stay up there forever. And I really am always in awe of someone who comes up with something that becomes a classic. Jeans never thought they'd be a classic. They were invented for farmers. They were invented, actually brought to the United States 
for gold diggers, you know, um, not the dancing one, the kind that actually did gold. And they, they, they had to be tough because they were in the gold mines and they put the gold in their pockets, which is why they had those rivets there so the gold nuggets wouldn't fall out. Who would ever think? I mean, I know in the 60s, if I put on a pair of jeans, my mother said, I'm not looking at you, I'm so embarrassed. But they were our favorite thing. Now I've spoken with some of my students who have 70 and 80 pairs of jeans. And think about, they're not 9.99 either. Okay, so when, oops, I moved ahead just a bit. I did it, great. So think about this group over here, the late majority, who are the people that fall into the trends later. And then we have this group when it's really fallen off and they're called the laggards, which is such a nasty term, it sounds very negative. But my point is, this is guaranteed to happen with every trend you'll see, it goes through this whole pattern. An innovator would have been someone like Jacqueline Kennedy, because look how many people copied her during that era. However, she probably had guidance and was very good friends with the perfect designers. Now, I found this, and I thought this was very funny. Here's Jackie in yellow and black, and yellow's not always <clears throat> a very popular color. And here's Taylor Swift, and it's today and then. Same thing. I don't think Taylor Swift actually planned this, but I just want you to see how these trends do actually come back. In order for something to succeed as a trend, it has to have three very important things. It must have a particular style, and now we know what style means, right? So a jeans jacket, a pair of um, high-heeled boots, bell bottoms, a particular style, camouflage. That's something that I want to talk about, and I'll tell you an experience I had. Okay, so we have a great style. If no one likes it, it's not gonna become a trend, that's pretty obvious. So then it, if it has acceptance, it's okay. It has to have, it has to be the right thing at the right time. And that, in 2001, on September 8th, I was in Paris and I saw camouflage clothes all over the street. I mean, people were wearing them, they were selling them on the street, they were selling them in the stores. I said, all right, I really like the way it looks. And, then I said, I'll buy one in a few days, and September 11 happened, and it was gone. So you talk about timeliness, that's what happened. On September 8, 2001, the buyers were in New York, and they were buying sweaters. The color for the spring, the next season, was going to be pastels and brights, sort of com combined. September 12th, they called all their manufacturers and said, grays, beiges, blacks, tans, we'll save those colors for later. The little secret to that is many products that are bought in bulk are done in what they call grayish fabric, which means they're not always dyed immediately. So that wasn't a very difficult thing to change. Okay, so let's talk about colors. Excuse me, one minute. I mentioned yellow. And yellow's not always a popular color, but for some reason, every store I've been into this year has a little yellow in it. I see a yellow dress or a yellow sweater. It's very popular. Today, there's Mrs. Obama. We call it marigold. I don't know how many of you saw the State of the Union when she wore this dress. Anybody? Okay, and I, I laughed because someone on Facebook said, did you see that disgusting color that she's wearing? Okay, you wanna know what the other people said? This dress had been available since August. It typically cost $2,095, but was on sale for $628 at 70% discount. By the end of Obama's 58 minute speech, the dress was sold out online at Neiman Marcus. By the, and the designer was Narciso Rodriguez, who does a lot of her clothes. So there you go. That's sort of a celebrity introducing, I mean, you know, having a lot to do with fashion. And what I love about this is she wore that with a purple coat. 
though I give her a lot of credit. Pardon? Yes, they are. And you know what? I haven't seen purple and yellow together since the 60s. So let's talk about colors. They called it marigold. This is lemoncello. The colors I'm going to show you now that are the new spring colors, these are all slides, if you'll notice, for menswear. But that doesn't mean you won't be wearing them also. Okay, lemoncello. And when you see a trend report, you'll also see, often see re references, bananas, marigolds, a frog, a door painted that color. That's where that trend inspiration really comes from. Okay, our trend reports for fashion are done by a company I'm sure you've hold, heard of called Pantone. And these are the spring 2016 colors, which means the colors you're supposed to be wearing this year. You don't have to. There's not a law. If it looks horrible on you, don't wear it. It's so easy. If you buy it and it's in your closet and every time you put it on you go, Ugh, or whatever, um, and you put it back, then don't wear it. You don't give it to someone who it'll look good on or wear it with a scarf to make it look like you're wearing a different color. But anyway, if you'll notice, they all have wonderful names like um, Rose Quartz, Peach Echo, Serenity. I love Snorkel Blue, okay? We'll talk about that later. Buttercup is the new yellow. Um, Lilac Gray, Fiesta, Iced Coffee. The woman who was, still is actually, the, the head of Pantone, she's the one that helps them all decide on these colors, used to go to Starbucks every day for coffee. And she sat there one day and she said, this is strange. Everybody loves coffee. I'll bet it's going to be a big color. And sure enough, you've seen brown emerge in the color wheel or in what's popular. And on the bottom, you see green. And it, this one's called Green Flash. When I was a buyer 100 years ago, I worked for a wonderful woman who said, no matter what you buy, and she spoke like that also, it was terribly annoying, do not buy green. And I said, OK. And I said, why? She said, because no one looks well in green, good in green. Someone here is wearing green, I'll bet, because I always wind up getting a red face. But what happened is green was the kiss of death for buyers. And now, in the last 20 years, it's become a very popular color. And it has a lot to do with ecology, with the greening of America, with the fact that green is used in every advertisement that you see, because it's a very popular feeling, which is green and it's fresh. OK, so here we go. We look at the same colors again. I just wanted to give you better, um, a better picture. I think they're great. They remind me a little bit of, desert, of the desert, and they're fresh and nice colors. So men's color trends and inspirations. Beautiful green, a great shade of green. Citrus orange for men. I'll bet you've seen men in sweaters or polos this color, and you'll see them in pants. But notice the inspiration is quite good. Mauve mist. That sounds very masculine, doesn't it? Deep ocean, which is actually a beautiful shade of blue-green. Butterscotch, which is what used to be rust about 40 years ago. Brown, which was never accepted, but now a good rich brown, like chocolate, so I like that. See the chocolate? Dark, dark indigo, which is a new name for dark denim. That color. Chamois, very natural. And faint gray. These are all men's colors, also women's colors. So I suggest you all go out and buy something in this color and try and find a man who understands it. OK. This process of color and of designers knowing what to put on the runway actually takes from two to five years to happen. And the way that it happens is we have people called trend spotters. And they do this for a living. They're out on the street. They read everything. They see every movie. They go to the theater. They're involved with all the music. And there are even kids that are hired as cool 
trend hunters, and I think they're called cool hunters, actually. And they're out on the street. They give them a camera. They say, take a picture of anyone you see that looks different, that looks cool. They saw kids wearing flip-flops with socks a few years ago. And then you started to see shoes with toes in them. That's how that evolved. But anyway, so they start out about two to five years ahead, and they get the trends. They also look at all of those things I told you about, politics, movies, celebrities, and so forth put that whole combination together, and they work. And they put their ideas together. And then they talk, and this is really simplified. If you're in the business, I apologize for making it a little easier than it is. Then you have the trend people who are amazing, the color people. They get together every two, two years for a huge conference. And what they do is they decide on what colors are going to be popular for the next few seasons. And they all agree on the names. I can't wait to go to that conference someday where everyone agrees. Then you have the fabric designers who refer back to the trend, to the color people. And then you have the designers. And when they start a collection, the first thing they do is they get their inspiration. But they also talk to the fabric people so that they know what's available. Then after the designers have put their collections together, you get the buyers who come in and they say, we'll take it or we hate it, or we love it or we'll hate it, or it's going to work or it's not going to work, or oh, I think you should change the sleeves and then you should change this. And if anyone here is a designer, you know I'm telling the absolute truth. Then you have the consumers. So this whole process actually takes around three to four years for it all to keep evolving and stay fresh. So here's some good advice from Karl Lagerfeld. I found it ironic that this, this was right on one of his dresses. I don't know how that happened. But trendy is the last stage before tacky. So good fashion is really not about wearing all of the trends, but updating and sort of having a good time with what's available to you. So now I go over to the next subject. Why do we wear clothes? It's sort of important to know that. Anybody know? When, when somebody said to cover your body for protection, to impress your friends. I like that. There's the only honest person in the audience. Um, what? Creative expression. OK. your own personal style, you're all right. And I really have narrowed it down to about six different reasons, and I'll tell you. The first one is, I ask, is it really modesty? People did not start to wear clothes originally, supposedly, to cover themselves up. So I just put a few little jokes up there in case I'm really boring. But you can look at them. But anyway, it is identification. That's really important, and I love this bingo card, because every one of those blocks, you can close your eyes and you know what they look like in their outfit. Am I correct? That's really pretty amazing. The only kind of fashion that we see that really stays the same is ethnic attire, because it's very cultural and it stays the same for years and years. The biggest reason people wore clothes is for protection. It got cold out there. You know, or the women who were the gatherers, right, had to do something so they could bring home the seeds and they could bring home what they picked up in the um, fields. So they created skirts. They put a piece of fabric around them and made into what carries, you know, all of that junk home because they didn't have plastic bags. Anyway, I love this because this sort of tells a little story to me about Joe the caveman who went out one day and he, I, that's supposed to be a bear, I guess, and he wore the bear skin and she got the inside, which is suede. And um, he said, you know, I want you to keep that bone as sort of something that'll give you good luck. Because if you wear that bone all the time as a good luck talisman, maybe I'll catch a bear every day. But the bottom line is it was the first rubber band to hold your hair up. This is a designer called Jeremy Scott, who works for Moschino now, who has a great sense of humor. And he actually came up with a collection that was influenced by the caveman. That's called going all the way back. Superstition, without a doubt. You've seen amulets. 
Mystery of the Bride, another reason that all evolved over the years. Sexual attraction, yes, it's wonderful to have a nude shoe, but the people who created the nude shoe said that makes a woman's leg look so much longer. So let's do that, and people are, feel very flattered in it. This, of course, is foot binding, um, which is illegal, but that shoe is five inches long, and I've seen them as small as three and a half inches long. So, that's why people wear clothes. This is how little fashion has really changed. Look at these silhouettes, 1700s to the 2000s. You have, I did it again, you have a narrow waist, a full skirt, an even fuller skirt. You get down to a, a small one, it keeps going up. Every century, there's a change in the silhouette, but it really is pretty much the same. You can see the 50s, 60s, and so forth. I'm not so sure we're ever going to go back to this or this again, because they're not going to build houses big enough for us to live in them. So fashion is always the same. This is sort of a recap of trends and fashion. It's always the same, but it adapts to the times. Because of the media, I don't have to tell you how influential the media is, politics, demographics, where you live, you li your lifestyle, economics, geography, all of these things, technology, and the biggest one of all is zeitgeist. Know what that means? The spirit of the times, and it's absolutely what is what creates the world we live in today. But some fashion, as I mentioned, never changes, which is influenced by culture, reflects a region, reflects needs of a lifestyle, it's passed down from generation to generation. And you can go to some countries where they dress in a modern way, but there are also many times that they wear ethnic or clothing from their culture. I think of uh, Scotland and men wearing kilts, and they just never will stop doing that. We've had the ethnic look on the runway. Um, <clears throat> it's something you'll see again a lot this year, that influence. And it's amazing to me that this all started with a single piece of fabric, because that's what men and women had. You could use it for a sling, or you could use it for a fabulous shawl, but that wasn't how it was meant to start. There's two kinds of clothing that are made out of that single piece of fabric. One of them is draped. And there we have just an original draped piece. Madame Gray was a designer in the 1900s, and uh, uh, probably till the 60s, I think, in France. And um, her pleating and draping was truly magnificent. And then we have cut and sewn. I love this picture because it really lets you know how hard someone works to do that. The classic Egyptian was just a triangular piece of fabric. And the way they were defined was by the embellishment, by the way they were tied. Um, you can see the figure of the woman there. Here's a very typical, this is in a, a museum, a, a beautiful piece, and quite frankly, I think I would wear it today maybe with a sweatshirt under it or something, but it would be very good. But it's very, very elegant, and it's done with beading. I brought in Michael Costello's draping because I think he's a local designer who will be at Fashion Week again with 10 Project Runway designers this year with him. I had to get that plug in. But anyway, um, and he really just worked from this basic concept of, of draping, and he has been very successful with it. We have a lot of the influence of the early Greco-Roman fashion today. This is just off of the runway uh, two seasons ago. And it all started with this, with the Greeks, and a great big, huge fabric, piece of fabric that was very heavy that all the men just draped over their shoulders, sort of like you'd like to do with a big blanket. And I have to tell you, I found out that they couldn't wait to take it off. So they would all go somewhere, hang out together, and just wear nothing. But luckily, clothes came back in style. Greek women, of course, were a little vainer, wanted to look pretty. They took that piece of fabric, and they cut a hole in it and put it over their head, just like today's ponchos that are one of the biggest biggest trends you've seen, and they connected them all with very fancy pins called fibulae, which you may hear, and it's a great crossword puzzle word. 
Anyway, and then they just put a belt around it. I love this comparison of then and now. The women's garment was called a peplos, which was, again, one piece of fabric. And you know how we all like that bare shoulder look? And Donna Karen brought it back, and Barbara Streisand wears it. And do you know why it's so popular? You have every answer. I'm going to give you a free magazine at the end of this. It's the only part of our bodies that don't age, if we're a little bit careful. And it's still very provocative. So the shoulder is really a great look. Sad, though, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> There was a culture on the island of Crete um, which fascinated me because they were the Minoans and they lived on an island. And unlike the Greeks and the Romans, they traveled. They, they didn't have to defend themselves because they lived on an island and everyone couldn't get there. But they traveled and they found things like belts, leather. They found feathers, buttons. They put curls in their hair, and they have this extremely um, popular kind of look that you will actually see in other influences later on. So they came up with that pleated pyramid kind of look. They were very innovative, and they really loved fashion. So I don't have time, but there could be an hour's lecture, lecture on how fabulous these people were with fashion. Roman togas. One piece of heavy wool fabric, 18 feet wide by 11 feet high. That's probably the size of this screen as I look at it. And they draped it, and there was a very specific way to drape that, generally made out of um, white wool. Only citizens were allowed to wear them. Uh, they had to follow laws called sumptuary laws. I don't know if anyone knows what they are, but they're the kind of laws that say, if you're not a policeman, you can't wear a policeman's uh, costume. Or they can say that if you're royalty, you can wear purple. But if you're not, you can't. Or if you're a slave, you must wear stripes. Those rules in fashion went on forever. And I remember the last one I heard is you never should wear white shoes before June. <laughs> it wasn't a law. It was my mother. Okay. So talking about the toga, in 2013, Diane von Furstenberg put them all on the runway in these great colors. It was all influenced by this same thing. And notice that was three years ago. It's still very much in style. Gladiator boots. People are wearing these. Have you seen people wearing them? OK. I think it must take hours to get in them. But anyway, they, they had their look. Um, <clears throat> So I talked about how fashion changes. And these eras that we've discussed previously were like thousands of years, hundreds of years. Now, when people started to travel, they had other needs. For instance, men realized that they were going to be riding or walking. They actually needed to wear boots. So these boots were called buskins. They were made out of suede. And you can buy them today at Saks. By, and they're made by Manalo Blahnik, and it's an exact sort of copy of that kind of shoe, except I think it has like a 10-inch heel. But I just want you to see that influence. Then we go through the Byzantine era, which was in a place that was in the most perfect part of the world. Everyone traveled through that era. And they had lots of money, because they charged you taxes and tolls to go through there. And because of that, Great opulence, great riches, gold in everything they wore. And this is the area that it was. And people would go to, to the Orient and uh, to Africa and so forth. And the world opened up a lot, even though this was a very long time. You've probably all heard of Justinian and Theodora. They were a terrific couple. Today, they would be like the first couple of somewhere. But she had great style um, and a lot of opulence. Uh, gold on everything. And here we have a picture of Dolce & Gabbana with Katy Perry, who was at the Met Ball two years ago wearing a picture of uh, Theodora in a gold dress. So it's interesting how that also translated. So there's so much inspiration out there for designers. 
the people brought back a lot of Asian influence and the clerical robes you see to get today were really inspired by, by the Oriental influence, very opulent. And here we have today's kaftan. And here we have that color, which is called snorkel blue. I think it's the most unattractive name, but it does make sense. The start of real fashion as we know it, which delineates castes and delineates classes happened around the medieval era. And you can see the opulence. Now everybody in the culture in those days did not have clothes like this. But if you were royalty or you owned a kingdom, you would probably dress like this. The rest of the people who worked for you would wear sacks probably made out of potato or flour sacks. However, every so often, the queen of the kingdom or the knights would hand their clothes down and about 20 people would take those dresses apart and make clothes for themselves. So that's how it sort of transpired into an industry. This, of course, Dolce & Gabbana two years ago, and I think there's a great deal of inspiration there too. Now we get into funny clothes. Men were traveling. Men had to identify themselves. So this was when you learned about heraldry and they had big insignias of what, you know, what serfdom they belonged to. Um, and these were called party-colored tights. They protected their legs, of course, and their shoes made their legs look even longer. Pointed toes, so we'll get to that. But they very often would be two colors, and that was a very, very elegant way to do, to be, is, is to have this, these colors of your family uh, on your, you know, on what you were wearing. And you can see that up even in the corner up here with the colors and the shields. Men in tights today. What's actually happened is that a lot of designers feel that men should be able to wear leggings too. And you know what? I've seen a lot of men in their running clothes at leisure, which is very popular today, and that will transpire to this look. So it's just coming back to the way it was. Medieval fashion, men's shoes, very pointed toes. Now, I think I saw them in Las Vegas once, these shoes. I don't know where they are today. OK, and their shoes are called Poulains. And um, of course, typical of society, the longer the point was of your toe, the more elegant you were, and so forth. Sometimes they were so long that men attached a chain to the tip of the toe and then tied them up around their ankles. Um, and they were called Krakows, just in case anyone ever needs to know that. And that, of course, is a very popular shoe. We talk again about other shoes um, in the 15th century because of the Renaissance, because people were moving around a lot more, women were wearing beautiful fabrics. They were wearing dresses that were very, very full, and they loved to show off that fabric. That's why skirts got very wide again. Unfortunately, the women would have to go outside every so often. And I'm going to use an expression that's not particularly elegant, but when they stepped outside, it was muck and mire, to be honest. And they had to wear a shoe like this to keep their beautiful fabrics from dragging in the muck and mire. So that's how a Chopin like this actually evolved, um, which is our platform shoe. And my first question is, when did platform shoes evolve? How many of you have platform shoes on today? There's one. Go to the store. Again, I just hit Saks a few weeks ago, and they're all there, and they're all, you know, um, they're really very, you know, I can't read the label. I think it's Lanvin, or can you? That says Jimmy Choo, that's OK. And those are 20 inches high, these. And I shot that picture at a shoe exhibit, which was probably the most fascinating thing I ever saw at the Victoria and Albert Museum. And they had shoes from this big to a shoe like that. So nothing is really new, again, of course. A little bit about, I talked already about how the shape of all of these clothes keep changing. What I want you to know is under these dresses, 
which were separate pieces. The skirt was separate, the stomacher, the long piece was separate, the sleeves were separate, they were all pinned on. Underneath it were probably five layers of undergarments too. So everybody needed help getting dressed in the morning. I'm sure you've heard that many of the kings um, and hired people and people would vie in the court to be able to be the person who handed the king his washcloth or put on his pants or helped him with all of that. So it was before TV, what else could they do? Okay, a little inspiration, the Renaissance, Dolce & Gabbana, taken right from those clothes that we just saw. And keeping that in mind, showing you what's new for spring and fall, straight from Paris, Comme de Garçon. Who wants one right now? I'll buy it for you. <laughs> that is isn't just the kind of fashion that just makes an expression. It's art. And it's from a designer, uh, Ray Koakubo, who really likes to shake you up a little bit and also shakes up other designers. And there was someone on the street during the fashion week wearing something very similar to this. And she's like one of the biggest bloggers ever. So that sums up my feeling on bloggers. This is just last week what we saw from Givenchy. This has become a classic at animal print, which is good. I think we see that every year. Um, this, to me, has a little Renaissance influence. Could also have been a suit worn in, you know, the 70s or 80s, except now you have to have a little bit of your belly showing to make it work. Not going to happen. Okay. The same designer, lots of gold. You saw pictures that actually look a lot like this, too. Um, Nina Ricci, red is back, is a fabulous color. This, again, is now, so it's going to be for spring. And here's a gorgeous uh, red dress, something that I probably saw many years ago, but the fabrication is what's so very special about it. From elegance to another designer, Julian David, who is waking up a lot of fashion editor's attention because he uses a lot of fabrics that are very technologically influenced, a lot of color. And this is really much more comfortable clothing and more the lifestyle that people are living with, which is let's have a little fun, let's just get a little more casual. Um, usually you'll see these people wearing sneakers, that kind of a look, a little high technology. I look at this and say, great, I can take out that old silver sweater I've had for 40 years. <laughs> so that's how you have to think. But pair it with something else. A little sort of you know, bomber jacket or shirt jacket, that's right back from the 80s again and 90s. Now the spring trends are a little different because we're in spring now. This is about a retro look. So we have the very preppy retro look here that's been updated. This to me is mid-century modern, but back with a little beautiful new fabric in great colors. Pajamas are a huge influence. The look of lingerie and pajamas, I'm really trying to figure out why. Other than I think maybe people are binging on, you know, Netflix and they want to look elegant while they're doing it. I have no idea why, but I sort of like it, and I'm sure I'll see somebody walking around in their pajamas because of it. But Gucci did it in a very elegant way. Ralph Lauren did it in just a, a velvet jumpsuit. Slips, again, lingerie. Calvin Klein's entire line for this uh, season was lingerie slips, very minimalist. And you all saw this before, didn't you? And I think a lot of it was... Um, Desperately Seeking Susan, and am I right from that era? Madonna, The Slip, or am I in a wrong era? I may be wrong, but I think you know what I mean. The Row, beautiful, elegant fashion. Stripes, we had lots of stripes this year. They're going to continue this from Dior, which is very strong. Note, her handbag does not match her dress, and that's a lesson for everyone. And, of course, this Chloe look is very gorgeous. Very pretty, very romantic, very flamenco influenced, Oscar de la Renta, Michael Kors, two different levels of fashion, 
but very, very close in their inspiration. The word I keep hearing everywhere is romantic. So that's good. And then lots of sequins. So you can get out that sequin sweater you've been hiding away for a while, too. But lots of sweet sequins. I can't imagine a trench coat in sequins, but think about it. Wouldn't that be great to wear over a gown instead of like one of those shawls that look like they came from the Greek uh, era? And uh, there's the other one. And again, very romantic by Chanel and Carolina Herrera. And I thank you.